Hello there. So on Monday, I released a blog post on my website that detailed five different Greek myths specifically about the gods. Now, I've been a fan of mythology in general for so long that I can't really trace it back to any particular age, but I can trace it back to Greek mythology. Uh, I don't remember a time when I didn't know something about Greek mythology, and it led into all the different mythologies that I truly enjoy. And honestly, there's not one mythology I enjoy. I love them all. So leave a comment of your favorite mythology, and maybe I'll get to those in a later video. I'm going to try to do at least one mythology post every month, so keep a lookout. Today I'm going to go into three more myths about the Greek gods, because there are so many stories about the Greek gods, and honestly, they're really fun and a great place to start in Greek mythology, more so than the heroes, because we do know a bit about the Greek heroes, such as Hercules. Really Heracles, but let's not split hairs. Now, if you want to read about the five stories that I detailed on my website, authorbwilson.com slash blog, you can go there. Also, there's a link in the description below to that specific blog post. The ones in the post were The Clash of the Titans, Athena and Arachne, The Apple of Discord, Prometheus Steals Fire, and The Kidnapping of Persephone. These five are really a great start when it comes to Greek mythology, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit more to start with here on YouTube. The Three Fates. The ancient Greeks had a reason for everything, and there was always a god that kind of oversaw everything. And a lot of times they excused history for what the gods were doing. Now you start with the god of the underworld, Hades, and then you go all the way to the god of death, Thanatos. And you have about 22 gods associated with the underworld alone. Oh, and that's not even including the daemons and the beasts that go along with that. And any underworld stories, such as Sisyphus and so many others, punished in Hades. So, there's a lot to go for. But there are three goddesses that I'd like to talk about right now. And they are the Fates, or also known as the More. They weave the Fates of every living being. So, from a little mouse, to an insect, to a person, or even the gods themselves. They control the fate of everything that could possibly exist. Oh, and by the way, they are nothing like the fates that you see in Disney's Hercules. While it obviously is inspired by the three fates, they don't share an eye, and uh, they're not gross and weird and kind of cackly old hags. They are sometimes portrayed as hags, but they, they're they not like that. But even in Disney's Hercules, Hades respected the fates. And the reason was not just because they controlled the fate of the gods or mortals of any kind. It was because they were unquestionable and completely neutral. They didn't care whether it was a lowly fly getting swatted, or if it was a high god. Clotho is the youngest. She spins the thread of life, the birth of each individual. Lachesis is the middle sister and prevents fate during life. Her name also touches on the idea that each person's destiny has multiple paths and outcomes. She also measures the life thread with her rod, to determine the life's length and nature. Whether you would have a hard life or if you were going to have an easier life, she knew exactly where you were going to go, but you also had many paths that you could choose. And finally, Atropos, who cuts the life thread and determines how someone will die. I actually find it funny that the fates were all female and that the male gods had nothing to do with how life began, 
happened or ended. So I think that's really funny in a mostly male-dominated civilization that they would come up with the women would be the ones uh, determining fate because there were plenty of men who were determining some fates back then, let me tell you. So let's talk about Pandora's box. Now, in colloquial language, we use Pandora's box to refer to something that really shouldn't be messed with, that it will only cause problems if you open this box or open the conversation to certain things. And in some ways, that is true. But the thing about the myth is that there are so many iterations. All the iterations do have Pandora opening this box. And we'll get to exactly what all that means in a minute. But there are many different tales. Sometimes Pandora is evil, sometimes she is not. And I personally prefer the one where she's not and that she's gifted by the gods all these different gifts. And I will list them here of what exactly the gods gave her, which actually led to all the events in the story. For the sake of this video, I'm going to focus on Hesiod's version, so let's get on to it. The Agony actually details something that I presented in my first post on my website, which was Prometheus Stealing Fire. And to understand this part of the story, you kind of need to know that part. Now, before we begin, quick refresher. Prometheus liked humans, Zeus, the king of the gods, didn't like humans, and Prometheus didn't care and decided to steal fire from the gods and give it to humans. Zeus found out, punished Prometheus. So Zeus wanted to punish humans even further for Prometheus stealing the flame. And honestly... If you know anything about Greek mythology, you know that Zeus, king of the gods, is not a benevolent god. He is... I don't care for Zeus. Just gonna say it. Zeus wanted to punish the world further and had Hephaestus, the god of fire and craftsmanship, aka smithing, to create a woman for the gods to bestow gifts upon. Zeus then entrusted a box filled with everything miserable and evil. She was named Pandora, meaning all gifts. Zeus gifted Pandora to Prometheus's brother, Epimpheus, who either forgot or didn't heed Prometheus's warning never to accept a gift from Zeus. Epimpheus, god of afterthought and excuses, made Pandora his wife. Some myths call the box a wedding present to Pandora, at which time she is told not to open it. Sheesh, isn't that the worst thing to be god of? I'm sorry, at least Thanatos, god of death, has a job. Ooh. Now, Epimpheus and Pandora were happy for a long time. At least in this myth. Sometimes she opens it immediately and that's all she wrote. But in Hesiod's story, it takes a long time, so we're going to go with that one. Unfortunately, she always wondered about the box, and eventually she does open it. By opening the box, she releases sickness, death, jealousy, famine, hatred, strife, pretty much anything bad we know in this world. Realizing what she had done, she tried to close it before anything could get out anymore and return everything back to the box, but it was too late. Luckily, Zeus did have something good in the box, and that was hope. This is the last one for the day, and it's a little bit funny and a little bit petty. And what are the gods if not funny and petty? It begins in a city-state originally known as Procropria, named after Cecrops, the first king of Attica. The gods were not too keen on this name, considering... You know, it wasn't named after them, and again, they are petty and selfish, and that's just what the gods are. The two main gods who wanted to become the city's patron and namesake were Poseidon, god of the sea, and Athena, goddess of wisdom. 
also war. I'm sure you can already guess who won the battle, but the story is still important. Unable to decide between themselves who would become the patron of this city, they turn to Zeus. And in true Zeus fashion, he passed it off to another person. Or really, the people of the city. Okay, I'm I'm not going to give Zeus too much crap on this because that's kind of the right decision because it's their city. Anyway, Poseidon and Athena decide to hold a competition to see who will gain the people's trust and love for naming their city after them. Poseidon was first. He struck a rock with his trident, sprouting a fountain and a spring prompting that the city would always have water and there would never be drought. Unfortunately, the water was salty, just like the sea. Shame. People didn't like that too much. For obvious reasons. They can't drink it. It's salty. I mean, have you ever tried to drink salt water? Ugh. Yuck. Next, Athena. Athena struck her spear into the ground, and an olive tree sprouted, promising food, oil, and firewood. The people rejoiced and loved this olive tree, and so henceforth the city was named Athens to honor Athena, and they built the Parthenon, which still stands to this day, albeit a little worse for wear. I hope you enjoyed these myths as much as I did today. If you would like me to discuss other mythologies, such as Egyptian, Norse, etc., please leave a comment in the section below, and I will hopefully get to that. I would love to talk more about mythology anytime I can. Please check out my mythical poem, The Golem, on AudreyBWilson.com, and check out my other works as well. I post blogs every Monday, and you can also sign up for my monthly newsletter there on the website as well. Unveiling the facade is still accepting beta readers. Link in the description below on how to sign up. Bye. Until next time.